So there was a young man who was born in rural North Carolina, he and a single mother. And they had a hard life, a hard, really fight to survive kind of life every day. And he made up his mind one day, I'm never going to live like this again. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to provide for my mother. Uh, or his father had left when he was very, uh, he was very young. So he went and he got, a, he got an MBA and he decided to go work for a hedge fund. He became very successful. He made millions and millions of dollars. His mother was a simple country woman. She didn't want very much in life. So he never knew what to really get her. So he just bought her some land and a nice house in the country, simple home. That's all she really wanted. And as the years went by, he didn't know what else to really provide for his mother. So he looked on the internet and he found these exotic birds from New Zealand that uh, cost $150,000 a piece, which to him was not much money. So he thought, you know what, I'm going to do that. These birds are special because they can talk, they could sing, and they could dance. So he thought this will really be a nice treat for her. She's lonely at home. These birds might give her some companionship and things like that. So he said, I'm going to do that, $300,000. Birds get shipped from New Zealand to her home out in the country for her birthday. And he calls her and says, Mom, did you get the birds in the mail? They're for your birthday. She said, yes, honey. Thank you. They were delicious. It was like an exotic, it was like a dark meat, you know, I needed, I needed some fried chicken and it was really, really good and I appreciate it so much. She says, Mom, you ate the birds, they could dance, they could sing, they could talk. She said, well, they should have said something. They... <laughs> but thank you for sending them, it was a miracle. It was just when I needed some chicken. You know, you hear the word miracle a lot. Like, how do you define the word miracle? I think it gets bandied around a lot, miracle. Uh, you know, a rule of thumb in sermons is never to read from a dictionary, but, and here I have to. Uh, miracle is a surprising and welcome event that's not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore seen as a work of divine agency. And you know, when we read the story today in John chapter 6, I'm going to question that definition of miracle. And when you hear this story that many of us have heard, if you grew up in church, this is a famous story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's one of his many, not, there's more than one account of him feeding thousands of people. This is just one of them, feeding 5,000 in John chapter 6. We're going to be hanging out in John 6 for the next three weeks um, and look at these, what we call miracles of Jesus, which to us are miracles. Uh, but to God, it's just God being God. John chapter 6, if you brought a Bible with you, you can read it or look on the screen or look on your phone if you have the Bible app. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves they left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. So if you have a scientific view of the world, purely naturalistic, you'll read that story and write it off and say that's impossible. Now, to some people, they could see God as sort of a, a blind watchmaker, sort of like Benjamin Franklin famously held to, or Thomas Jefferson famously held to, which we would call deism. They believe in God, but that God is absent from his creation, that he started the watch, he wound it up, 
and he let it run. He put all this into play, all the natural processes that we experience every day, and, but he's not really involved with it whatsoever. He might occasionally drop in and out, but other than that, he's not really paying attention uh, on a daily basis. Now, according to the Bible, however, God is not seen by that, uh, in that way at all, that God is portrayed as a divine being who upholds not just our world, but the universe in his hand, that he holds all things in creation by the word of his mouth, by the word of his, his um, command, really. It's his continuous creative power and will. If God were to stop being God and doing any of that, all of this would cease to exist. Um, Colossians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul gives us a picture of Jesus here, that in, in him he holds all things together. All things were created for him in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him. This is a big statement, right? And for him. He is therefore before all things, and in him all things hold together. So for people to go, Jesus is just a lesser deity, or he's just another option on the spiritual buffet of America, you are incorrect. The Bible gives us a picture that Jesus is in fact God, that he is God in flesh, and that he is Lord of all creation. There was no other God besides Jesus. There was no one else, on, no other name on earth given unto men by which we must be saved. So when you hear this biblical picture of who God is, that all things were made for him, all things were created through him. Then a better definition of miracle is maybe not just a surprising event that is not explicable to scientific laws, because that definition presupposes that, that science is a standard by which you determine a miracle, right? No, science and God are not at odds with each other, far from it. God is the definer of miracle, though, not us. Science merely discovers existent laws that are already in place. Scientists are merely discovering things that God wanted them to find, so to speak. It's because of his good pleasure that we discover the wonders of the planet and the universe. I would say a better definition of miracle is an extraordinary act of God. An extraordinary act of God. Feeding 5,000 people from a few loaves and fish is indeed an extraordinary act of God. If you go by this definition of miracle, not as merely bending the scientific laws around us, but it's an extraordinary act of God, if we do this, then you'll quickly see that there are literally miracles all around us every single day, every, every moment of your life. Even our very lives are miracles. Scientists cannot define or really have a reason for how the human eye even develops in the womb. This alone is a miracle. Apparently, what I'm looking at is upside down, and my brain turns it right side up. What? Who would invent? You couldn't evolve into that. You know, I was watching the National Geographic thing called In the Womb. Anybody ever seen this? And they have real in utero footage of children, of a fetus being formed. And at some point, as many weeks along in the process, the narrator says, a, a cutting device appears and forms the eyelid in the baby. Scientists don't know why this occurs. I'm like, you, yeah, you don't. I don't either. It's a miraculous thing. The, the forming of a human life, your life. You are utterly unique in the, all of the history of the world. In all the universe, there will never be another you ever. You alone, you are a walking miracle of God. You have, you have the image of God within us. There's the miracle of consciousness. The fact that people can even question your own existence. That sets us apart from the animals. Yes, we are animals, but we're glorified animals. And we have opposable thumbs. These are great, by the way. These really come in handy. I meant the pun there. They come in handy. That sets us apart, though. We're able, to, we're able to question our own existence. That you're even able to, to wonder about God. You're even able to question the, your role and purpose in the world. That alone is a miracle. Why do we have a conscience? Why is it there? What is it? There's the miracle of love. 
If you have a purely humanistic or evolutionary understanding of human life, love does not make sense. Because if we are here survival of the fittest, and I'm going to overcome and evolve past what was before me, then love should not be a factor. Why would I sacrifice myself if I'm just here to, to get more and more far along the, the track, so to speak? There's the beauty of nature, the detail of creation, the depth and breadth of intricacy of all that we see of life on this planet, how the earth is perfectly positioned on its axis. And if it moved by a simple, just a, just a small degree, we would either burn up or freeze. And perhaps the greatest miracle of all is that a human being can know salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the greatest work of miracle of God in our world today, that a person can confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and they shall be saved. That alone should be enough to convince people of God's existence. Almost like cause and effect. Because you feel this drawing, it shows the existence of God. That faith is evidence of things unseen. Just as you're hungry for food in your physical body, spiritually we hunger for the things of God. As Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is why so many people today are miserable and so deeply unhappy. Because you don't have peace with God. You don't have you don't know the God who created you, and He wants you to know Him. He wants you to be born again in the Spirit. That's why He died on the cross. So you hear all these astounding things, and we can, at the very least, take these miracles for granted. They become mundane in our lives. We can just take them for what they are. We can forget. Considering that we live within a world of extraordinary acts of God, is this story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people really out of the ordinary? It is to us, but is it to God? What if miracles are in fact ordinary to God? What if miracles are in fact the currency in which he spends every single day and he loves doing it? What if they're just the standard economy? What if miracles are who God has always been forever? He's not merely intervening in human history, but he's showing us a picture of who God is. He's generous. He's a servant. He's a giver. He's a provider. He's a protector. He's a creator. That you don't merely live in a natural world with the occasional supernatural thrown in just to keep things spicy and interesting. Rather, you and I are supernatural, immortal beings who happen to temporarily live in a natural world, all overseen by a supernatural God, that we live in the middle of hell and heaven. And yet this is why we see such a confluence of suffering and joy in the same place, that you and I are immortal. You have never met a mere mortal in your whole life, as C.S. Lewis said. All are either bound to heaven for living forever with God or to become more hellish after this life. After this life is over, people will either go to heaven, yes, or hell in a Methodist church. I will say that because Jesus taught on it repeatedly, dependent upon whatever people will do with the Son of God for themselves, choosing Christ for themselves, to know that the grace of God is poured out upon you. He wants no one to come under judgment. He wants no people to be, he wants all people to be with him. As Jesus said in the Gospel of John, that the Father's will is that, he, that Jesus will be lifted up and that all who will believe in him, Jesus, he will raise them up on the last day. This is the Father's will. So if you believe that God spoke the universe into existence, that he created the very laws of nature for us to discover, then feeding 5,000 people is pretty darn simple for him. Raising someone from the dead is entirely possible. Causing a virgin to be, take up child is entirely possible. Everything is on the table with a God like that. So I love this when Jesus looks at Philip and these disciples and he says, how are we going to feed these people? I have to think Jesus has a little smile on his face because he knew what he was going to do. He had to have a little glimmer in his eye. How are we going to feed these people, y'all? What do you think we're going to do? Tell me. I want to, I want to hear what you would say. Andrew who, is, who would consequently be, who was the catalyst for Simon meeting Jesus, Andrew 
brought his brother, Simon, to Jesus, and Simon became Peter. It's because of Andrew that we have Peter. Andrew at least speaks up and isn't entirely negative. The others are very cynical. How are you, six months away, just wouldn't even begin to pay these people, Jesus. Can you be kidding me? Andrew, though, goes, well, this little boy's got a little something here, but this isn't nearly enough. At least Andrew offers something. The other 11 disciples completely view the situation through the lens of the natural. Naturally, this does not make sense. We're never going to pull this off. The ordinary, the unexplainable, they're leaving no room for God to do the extraordinary, abundant thing. But Andrew at least trusts almost like a child. And he says, well, we have this. We could, maybe this could happen. Two weeks ago, we had vacation Bible school here. And I, um, I don't know how many VBSs I've done at this point. I had a real case of the VBS. That's my old joke about VBS. I love vacation Bible school. An amazing week. 140 plus children were here. And you, to hear their answers to questions, I, did, I was one of the leaders of Bible Adventures, so I would teach these groups that would come in. And to hear what they would say when you would ask them things like, why did Jesus die for us? And they'd say things like, because he, he loves me. Because I want to live forever with him. Why do we pray to talk to God? to have peace with God, to tell him how I feel. And you hear this wonder, right? This beauty, this innocence, this purity in their answers. Jesus said in Matthew 18, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. When my son was a little, a little, little guy, it snowed. I don't think it, it doesn't really snow anymore. <laughs> it snowed once. And in the morning, we got up. It was, it was actually early, early morning. It was late at night, actually. And it had fallen quite a bit. And we turn on the lights to the porch, and you just see white everywhere. And it's the first time maybe he'd ever seen it. And he just was just stunned. And it is. It's a, you're like just gazing in a wonder and amazement. And when we're children, we're like that. Everything is a wonder, isn't it? G.K. Chesterton said, What was wonderful about childhood is that anything in it was a wonder. It was not merely a world full of miracles. It was a miraculous world. The sad part is that we can lose that miraculous wonder to see all of creation as that. Why is it that kids so freely see it? Then at some point... It begins to kind of fade away, you know? And sadly, mystery and wonder can become a great embarrassment to the postmodern mind. At some point, adults, we can lose that wonder about life. Not always, but we can. We turn play into things called hobbies. We can transform wonder into certainty. We can even drop prayer and to simply do a Google search. But while mystery and wonder are an embarrassment to the postmodern mind, they are not, however, an embarrassment to the heart of God and to Jesus. Jesus asks them, how will we feed these people? And he invites them into the wonder, into the mystery, into that miraculous, what we call miraculous, extraordinary acts of God. So many people today seem to think that following Jesus is all about living right, just doing the right things. Now, that can be a part of your life later in your Christian faith, where with sanctification and fruit and bearing good fruit, absolutely. That's a bit of a cart ahead of the horse. Following Jesus is not about just living right. It's about living fully. Can you imagine the thrill of those men when they saw Jesus pulling this off? Walking around, the bread just kept coming. The fish just kept coming. How how long would it take them to feed 5,000? It took hours. Just kept coming. Never stopped. Twelve baskets left over, representing one for each tribe of Israel. 
God's a provider. He's abundant. He doesn't meek out blessings. Uh, I'll give you a little bit. Put yourself on that hillside. Imagine you're sitting next to him on the hill. And instead of looking at maybe picture in that valley, it's not just um, 5,000 people, but it's whatever your situation is. It's whatever you're facing or someone you know is facing. And you're sitting with Jesus on the hillside and you're looking at this insurmountable problem in the physical. And Jesus looks at you and he says, how are we going to deal with this? What would you say back to him? I think he'd probably answer your question with another question because he likes to do that. I think he would probably say, what do you have to offer? What can you put in? What can you provide? And let, let me do the rest. Maybe it's just a meager offering of some loaves and fish, but to God it's more than enough to work with. See, without God, you cannot. But without you, God will not. That our participation in the, the miracle is very important. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. God could create bread out of thin air if he wanted to. In fact, he did it for the nation of Israel, manna. But see, if for the miracle always begins with a step of faith and action on our, our part. So what's in, what's in the valley? What are you sitting on the hillside and looking at? That this looks absolutely impossible. If your resources don't seem like enough, perfect. You're perfectly positioned for a miracle. You're perfectly positioned for God to do the impossible, which to us is impossible. To him, it's not. As Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Amen. For Jesus is like no other. So give him whatever you have. As, as stupid and embarrassing as it might feel, just give it to him. We have a few pieces of bread, but this is nothing. Give it to him. And through him, through that gift, he will bless the world. Now, it's an amazing thing that this miracle of feeding 5,000 people, Jesus uses bread. And yet at the Lord's Supper, at, the last, at communion, he also would use bread, this very simple, tangible offering. And he, that night of, the, of his sacrifice, he, of the Last Supper, he took the bread he said, now, this is now my body. This is broken for you. I will be broken for you. As often as you take this meal, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, the cup of that Passover wine. He said, this is now in the cup of, my, of salvation. This is my blood shed for you, that through this there will be forgiveness of sins. This new covenant with God that will never be broken. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, be poured out upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ.